Hello, so in today's video we're going to be talking about James Ironwood, more specifically his turn from good guy to bad guy. More particularly, why is it exactly people had such a hard time believing that he could be this way? Because unlike other antagonists in the show, Ironwood has remained largely on the side of good, so he's really the first attempt at turning a babyface into a heel. Yet despite that, so many people still had such an adverse reaction to this turn and what it did to him as a character. So what impression did he leave on the audience so strong that the idea of turning him into an antagonist feels like a complete betrayal of his character? Well, to understand that, we must first understand where he started from. Ironwood was introduced in Volume 2, Episode 2, Welcome to Beacon. And his core personality exhibits much of what you'd expect from a stereotypical military leader. He's incredibly straightforward, blunt in what he says, and his solutions to problems is very much militaristic might. He believes in his army and the powers they have to crush whatever opposition dares to threaten the kingdoms. This comes much to the chagrin of the other figureheads, Glinda seeing him as always using it as a grandiose display as some sort of dick measuring contest, Crow sees it as all useless anyway, while Ozpin prefers to keep things in the shadows. The arrival of a fleet implies something ominous to the greater public and he'd prefer that they stay oblivious to what's really going on to keep them calm. Ironwood's approach to situations is often very direct and straightforward. Such a reliance on using force, on the surface, can very easily lead to what you'd imagine becoming an antagonist. But why wasn't he? Why did the audience accept such a man despite his direct approaches? Simple answer, it was because he cares. Ironwood possesses the core trait of empathy. He genuinely cares for the people of Remnant. He sees himself as well as the others as the protectors of the world. He cares for its well-being and all the citizens who are a part of it. Despite his squabbles with the others, he was very open-minded to Ozpin's guidance and suggestion and change of strategy opposed to his own. His care for the soul's sake of life is further reflected in the creation of the Atlesian Knights. Ask yourself, what is the purpose of creating robot soldiers? Well, there's no need to ponder it because he says it himself. The Atlesian military has always supported the idea of removing men from the dangers of the battlefield. However, there are still many situations that undoubtedly require a human touch. Robot soldiers are meant to cut down on the amount of human life lost in battle. If he can create an endless amount of fodder to fight against other endless amounts of fodder, then that's a net positive. His heart is undeniably in the right place, which ironically plays into being inspired by the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. The only difference here is Ironwood started out in the story already with his heart. Ironwood would continue to exist passively throughout the rest of Beacon's arc, mulling over with everyone about what to do against their enemy. And of course, everything comes to a head in the fall of Beacon. Penny's existence is exposed to the world and even Ozpin, who didn't know of her creation, and the Grim Attack. And it's his actions here which really solidified much of the audience's true view of him. Firstly, his speech towards the other students. Despite what you would expect him to say, telling them that they're all soldiers and they need to fight, is actually flipped on its head by the exact opposite. His directness doesn't hold back exactly what it is that's happening. Like a status report, he freely tells everyone how dire of a situation Beacon is in with Grimm running rampant over the city, the White Fang infiltrating the academy, and the fact that he's lost control over the skies. He doesn't hide or attempt to lead astray the situation the students find themselves in the midst of, which is presumably the exact opposite of what Ozpin would likely do. And he tells them that they have two options. They can either fight or save themselves. What should we do? You have two choices. Defend your kingdom and your school, or save yourselves. No one will fault you if you leave. It is yet again his empathetic nature which has him coming across as very understanding. Of course, to make a bad situation worse, his Atlesian Knights all get hacked and turned on the people, making it look incredibly bad on him as though it were his fault. But what's Ironwood's response? He doesn't protect the robots. He instead fights for the lives of the people. There's no hesitation in the destruction of his own design because they're not what's important. They have been compromised and he's working to protect the people that they're supposed to protect. And the whole thing culminates in a great resolution between him and Crow. Despite the two's personalities clashing heads throughout the season, when Ironwood thinks Crow is about to strike him down for believing he was the cause of the robots, he drops his arms and is fully willing to let Crow strike him down to prove his innocence. Of course, Crow wound up killing a Nevermore behind him, but he does say this. You idiot. 
I know you didn't do this. Despite the two always seeming to get on each other's nerves and bickering, this showcases that they simply understand each other. Crow knows that despite using his military and loving to do so, he would never do this. Despite an unprecedented sneak attack the group likely has never faced on this scale in recent history, you'll notice that Ironwood never seems to have lost control. I mean, in a literal sense, he lost control of his robots, but mentally he was quick to formulate plans and adapt to the situation. Someone's done the impossible and gained control of my machines. And that enormous grin seems to be fixated on the school. Glinda, form up with the local huntsman and establish a safe zone here in Vale. We need to evacuate Beacon. Crow, I'm leaving that to you and my men. I still need to get to my ship. It's precisely that militaristic experience which comes in much more handy than, say, someone like Crow, who likely wings his plans on the fly. After the fall of Beacon, Ironwood would return to his own kingdom of Atlas and begin planning accordingly from there. He does make yet another appearance in Volume 4 in two separate storylines. The first is much more passive and easily forgettable as outside of this one instance, the show has still never brought it up again since. And that's Yang's arm. It is a very easily forgettable gesture because all of the attention is on the fact that Yang got a new arm and not on the person who gave it to her, but it is an incredibly generous act of kindness to give a girl who's done nothing to actually earn it, nor being someone he has much relation to in the first place, a brand new arm. The only instance of them having interacted prior was him having to disqualify her from the tournament for breaking Mercury's leg. Outside of that, it's one hell of a gift to just send to someone. And of course, he does appear in Weiss's storyline as well. And in all instances, while interacting with her, Ironwood is nothing but respectful and courteous to her presence. The next interaction he has with Weiss is later at that fancy event Jacques is holding. During it, Weiss overhears how the people of Atlas are minimizing the events that transpired at Beacon. It's not just one, but the collective group of aristocrats. It all culminates in Weiss accidentally summoning a boar and Ironwood having to kill it. While the woman demands Weiss be arrested, Ironwood instead stands up for Weiss saying that she's the only one making sense. Ironwood too believes in the privilege this group has, and he's sickened to hear the struggles of others be so minimized. So with all that in mind, when the Atlas arc inevitably rolls around, the characters have since learnt of Salem's immortality and they arrive in a new kingdom, why is it exactly that the characters don't trust Ironwood? At what point in time did favor regarding whether or not this man was trustworthy fall out with them? Through his motivation to save the lives of humanity, to standing up for Weiss when he simply could have saved his public image with these people, to gifting Yang an arm. Why is it that even Crow doesn't feel as though Ironwood is the man he's proven himself to be? And even throughout the majority of Volume 7, Ironwood acts in almost the exact same way. He divulges his plans for what he intends to do with Atlas, is relieved to see Crow, one of the only people he considers a friend, and allows everyone access to his facilities and resources. In fact, it is precisely these reasons that Ironwood quickly rose in favor with much of the general audience this volume in particular because it kept painting the image that something's off about this man and I don't know about him. But all that wound up happening was he continued to act very rationally and in good faith. It's one thing when the people of Mantle see him as shady for what went down at Beacon and him locking down the kingdom for their own protection. But if there's one thing we've learned from real life, sometimes a lockdown isn't some authoritarian oppression, but instead a method to ensure people just don't die. So whether or not it was intended, this mainly just made the main group of characters look bad by comparison. Because all of the mental and emotional assault that was laid on him, he just took and any reaction from him in those moments would have only proved them right. But he never broke. Until the end of the volume. But even despite shooting Oscar, which, sorry Oscar, you're genuinely one of the really good characters in this franchise and was not the one deserving to be shot here, viewers have already spent so much time sympathizing with what he was going through. So once his breaking point was reached, the reaction isn't, oh, see, he's always been like this. Instead, it's more of a, well, what did you expect? Ironwood's treatment throughout Volume 7 is akin to that of a dog someone is trying to show is vicious and ruthless, but in reality, they're just a normal dog. So when the person starts abusing and smacking the dog and it doesn't attack you, you begin to feel more bad for the dog. But after you smack it a few dozen times and it's had enough of your shit and snaps and decides to bite you, you empathize more with the dog than the person who just got bit. 
Ironwood's breaking point felt less of a, oh, he's always been insane, and more of someone who's poured all of his trust into a group that's just abused it and stabbed him in the back. And I mind you, that it's not exactly what the main characters were doing. Taking a step back, Ironwood's plan wound up becoming one that would save the Staff of Creation, which would indirectly leave Mantle out to dry, almost certainly resulting in its death. So, Team Ruby and company were working to protect the people of the city, which is not inherently wrong. It just wound up being mixed between them acting like assholes and not working with or trusting Ironwood in the first place. Another reason people found themselves on the side of Ironwood in the beginning of the arc was because he was very relatable. Or at the very least, you were able to understand what he was going through. War is not always something that can be predicted. Oftentimes, it's a choice to get involved or take preemptive action, but other times, it is a necessity. It is the only option. The Atlas arc showcases both of these via two separate sides. Team Ruby represents being involved in this war by choice. They have sought out this danger and they can do as they please within it, such as drinking tea for five episodes. While Ironwood is involved by necessity, the war has sought him out and either he contribute or die. Befittingly, Ironwood perfectly represents the god of the company he's in command of is named after, Atlas, the titan god who carries the world on his shoulders. Ironwood too finds himself in a similar position to he. Ironwood is in command of the greatest military of Remnant. It is his duty to protect and defend the people of the world. And after learning of the true nature of Salem, her immortality, and how she can destroy the world, responsibility fell on his shoulders. If he didn't do anything, the world would die and all of its people killed. If he, with his army and resources, couldn't stop her, then who could? Ironwood bore the weight of the world on his own two shoulders, not because he wanted to, but because he had to. It was a situation the audience could empathize with. You see him trying to do what he thinks is the best course of action. And oftentimes it put him on the wrong side of a lot of people, like Jacques Schnee and the Huntresses of Mantle. They see him as a bad guy, when the truth is, is that he's just trying to protect them. It's a very complex dynamic, one that never really felt like there was a wrong side too, because in reality, there wasn't a wrong side. In the bubble of war, there is no real right answers. And it was that commonality during Volume 7 that wound up unifying them. Until they decided not to for some reason. By the time Volume 8 rolled around, it was as though all of the greater lessons that had been learned were thrown out the window to make Ironwood the villain. Clover's death was blamed on Ironwood despite him just telling him to arrest Crow, and Crow, who had known Ironwood and they seemed to be very close, now their relationship was thrown on rocky waters thanks to this one person Crow got to hang out with for a few days. It seems like everything was moving for the sake of drama, and they couldn't have picked a more unfit setting than war to do so. Because war is a sad and tragic thing. It shows us what we all have in common the love of family, the pain of loss, and the inevitability of death. War unifies and brings together those wishing to accomplish a similar goal under circumstances you wish never had to occur in the first place. The saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, is a popular phrase you've undoubtedly heard before. So what better enemy than Salem to show everyone that if we don't unite now, then that incredibly scary grim lady that is oddly arousing is going to kill everyone. And yet, it was the one theme that goes in direct opposition to this that Volume 8 chose to add and subsequently focus on. Distrust. Instead of being united on what they have in common, i.e. the giant space whale coming to destroy the world they're both a part of, it is what they don't share that drives them apart. Differing ideas on how to go about their plans and how they think things should be done. This momentary dispute between all of the characters will have no impact on the future of their friendships because whatever it is they're bickering about and upset about, at the end of the day, is incredibly superficial. And these sorts of disagreements pale in comparison to the substantive commonality. And it is that exact commonality in which Ruby attempts to unify the rest of the world. She hopes that everyone will come together to stand up and resist the forces of Salem while at the same time denouncing Ironwood in the process. And Ruby denouncing Ironwood just looks so bad because the whole situation shouldn't be about Ironwood because Ironwood isn't actively trying to kill everyone. It's about Salem and warning everyone to watch out. The whole reason Ironwood is the villain in this scenario is because he's going to be abandoning Mantle, which will make everyone die. Something that is not a direct part of his plan, but instead a result of it. 
If Salem makes it to another kingdom and Ironwood is there with the exact same plan, what will happen? Nothing. Because Atlas held a unique relationship to the way its kingdom worked with Mantle. In Vale, Mistral, and Vacuo, the Amity plan or launching Atlas into space wouldn't kill thousands because thousands aren't reliant on a giant floating kingdom above their head. The situation isn't about Ironwood, yet it still focuses on the superficial squabbles that are happening in the present. In reality, Ironwood has always been the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz, but he's always had a heart. Sure, his emotions were cold, he was blunt and straightforward, but his heart was always in the right place. He always cared. But by the time the Atlas arc rolled around, he was now becoming a central player into the story and they wanted to give him character development. So, how do you develop a Tin Man who already has a heart? You take it away. Except, that's not what happened. Despite what you may think about Ironwood becoming cold-hearted and dead inside from the recent volumes, is not quite true. Because no matter how much he escalated, his goal was still always save humanity. His care for human life is technically still there. But that's the problem. It's technically there. The truth and complete irony about the writers trying to play on the Tin Man gimmick is that they didn't get rid of his heart, but instead his brain. Ironwood's core character trait, which kept him humanized throughout every single one of his appearances, was his empathy. Without that trait, he's completely unrecognizable because there's nothing else humanizing him. He has no wife, he has no child, he has no family, he has nothing. Ironwood has one thing that keeps him human, and that's the one thing they got rid of. Someone can still remain empathetic while also being cold-hearted in the process. The perfect example of this is Winter. You see throughout multiple instances how Winter will often take no enjoyment through hypotheticals where she must sacrifice her own sister for the greater good. But she will still follow through with it. She keeps her empathy while also being able to say, yes, I would sacrifice my own sister. And if they wanted to have Ironwood lose his heart, then that's pretty much all they had to do. Show that he still cared about Mantle while struggling to turn a blind eye to what was happening. Put him in situations where he very easily could have helped by sending a portion of support or resources, but having to convince himself that he can't because it might cost everyone everything. But instead, they messed not with his heart, but his mind. It's not unlikely to assume the majority of people that would describe what happened to Ironwood was that he pretty much went crazy. He reached a point that just made him snap. And that's a curious thing to give to a Tin Man without a heart. Even his semblance focuses much more on his mental ability as opposed to his emotions. His semblance allows him to hyper-focus, which makes him more determined to follow through on decisions. There's a curious amount of focus on what's happening to him mentally as opposed to what's happening to him emotionally. This results in him shooting a council member, taking down refugee ships meant to evacuate the people of Mantle, and also threatening to commit genocide by nuking a city. If there's one thing almost 100% of people universally agree on, it's that committing genocide is usually what the bad person does. And it's precisely those reasons that so many fans who've come to like Ironwood that it feels like a complete betrayal of his character. Because while people will try and defend it saying, he's doing it for the greater good, that's never stopped him before from actually stepping in for the individual when they need it. It doesn't feel like the development of a character, but a butchering. And by proxy, it just makes everyone else look bad as well. By refusing to allow the audience to connect with him, he's escalated to such a ridiculous extreme that when the Aesops continue to stand by him through his insanity, you just have to ask why. Why are you going along with cold-blooded murder and genocide? They may have made Ironwood go crazy, but these characters haven't. They have no reason to be this loyal. And by keeping them as loyal as they are without any sympathy thrown towards Ironwood's way, which could make it feel like they actually care about him, it just makes them seem crazy for no reason as well. They took Ironwood at the most basic surface level for what he appeared to be and treated him as though he was always like that on the inside as well. They got rid of his empathy and his brain. And it is precisely that reason people had such an adverse reaction to Ironwood becoming an antagonist. Because yeah, if you get rid of the things that humanize a character and made them what they are, 
you can make anyone a villain, because at that point, they're just a blank slate you can do anything with. But let's get one thing clear here. It's hardly the fact that he was just made into an antagonist, because any character can be made into an antagonist. But it's the fact that you made him into a villainous antagonist. The show, not once, tried to get the audience to sympathize with him after his turn. They made every character around him scared just to show how fearful of him you should be. It never makes the attempt to have you feel like he's going through anything other than insanity. The Ironwood the audience fell in love with felt unrecognizable, and that was the problem.